Ivan Illich is a, a name that is barely known in the academy, much less popular. And, and I and friends of ours' mind think that obscurity is both undeserved and unhelpful. Um, because uh, we're convinced that, that his thought strikes at the very nerve of our current condition, our predicament now. Of course, having said that, everybody's going like, what the hell does that mean without an explanation? And hopefully over the, this evening and tomorrow, uh, the conversation will help clarify in what respect and to what extent that statement might be true. That Illich's thought strikes at the nerve of our contemporary condition, predicament. Um, I, I have a number of people to thank, so let's get that out of the way so we can have a conversation. Um, Above all, Daniel, who's not here. Daniel Purdy is not here. He runs, he's the director of the Max Cade Institute. And when I went around trying to get the shoestring budget filled, he was the one who first said, let's do it, and ponied up some cash. Um, in part, I think, because he understood uh, the center he's involved in is concerned with immigration, uh, foreigners, strangers, and he understood the significance of religious meditations on that question. Um, and Soon, right after him, was uh, Jonathan Brokop, who is not here either. I think all the people who gave the money said, hey, we've done our bit. We're going to stay away. Um, uh, Jonathan Brokop and Jeremy uh, Engels, Jeremy Engels. Wolfgang, welcome. Come. I'm glad you found your way. Um, Jeremy Engels, who also um, they run the initiative out of rock ethics called Religion, Spirituality, and Public Life. And evidently the book under, under launch is ostensibly about religion, but also uh, Brokop is well aware of Ivan's writing, Illich's writing on, on matters of ethics, and in particular bioethics, as contentious as that might be, uh, and thought it useful. Um, and last but not least, the Department of Philosophy uh, Ivan was here, when Illich was here from 84 through 98, 96, 96. Um, he was affiliated or, or a professor of philosophy and, um, and SDS. And um, when Jonathan Chrisman, who runs IAH, the Institute of Arts and Humanities, recommended to uh, Amy Allen, the head of philosophy, uh, she immediately ponied up some contribution. Um, and I think they begin to realize or perhaps agree with Georgia Agamben, who's written the foreword to this book, that um, uh, Illich's hour of legibility has po possibly arrived. Um, with that said, um, friends who have, at the drop of a hat in the 11th hour, jumped into cars from Toronto and flown in from Colorado and come from Princeton via Austria, uh, thanks to all of you guys who've shown up. So, uh, David Cayley, broadcaster of Much Note, ran the Ideas program at CBC at the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, uh, interviewed luminaries and not so luminaries, uh, has a way to interview people that uh, gets them to sound much smarter than they are. I am witness to that, which is why I say that. He had that. the treatment. Yeah, I had the treatment. Um, and is uh, sitting on a book of 300,000 words. Which Patrick <laughs> Alexander, to that. whom I owe thanks, uh, we're, we're going to try and shepherd that into print sooner yeah. or later. Um, Carl Mitchum, who's joining us, who was STS, head of STS back in the day, uh, went off to Colorado uh, and now teaches in China for four or six months of the year, teaches philosophers about engineering and assures us that Chinese philosophers uh, not only come prepared to the classroom, uh, but um, uh, uh, seem to be open and hospitable to the idea of considering engineering. Uh, he's written a number of books and, and will, will participate keenly on matters of technology simply because Illich, I think, learned a lot of the bibliography on the history of technology through Mitchum. Um, Wolfgang, who walked, he insists on walking, Wolfgang Palava, um, joins us via the the University at Innsbruck, uh, but is now at the Center for Theological Inquiry. Study, Theological Inquiry at Princeton, where he's spending a year um, 
four months. Doesn't seem like a year, though. Yeah, four months. Um, uh, extensively written on Girard and Matters theolo Theological, and uh, we're very much keen on listening to him, especially tomorrow, on the question of political theology. And Trent Shoyer joins us. Um, he, he's, been, he's been a brave man. He, the car broke down yesterday. He bought a new car just to get here. <laughs> Thank you, Trent. Uh, Trent, bravo. Trent, Trent, Trent was the president of the other economic summit. And he's written most recently Beyond Western Economics, of which I've learned a lot from that book, and um, now teaches on why sustainable development is against sustainability. <laughs> we shall unpack that uh, later. I also wanted to just say thanks to all of you again who, who've shown up, uh, many of whom did so because I asked, but none as, uh, none as, as, as uh, badly as Ryan, who sits next to me. He's a student in accounting. I had to twist his arm. I said, show no, up. No. <laughs> Come, you'll enjoy it. He said, but I'm an accountant. Well, he's here he is. He's going to try things out. <laughs> Um, good. So uh, with that said, I want to first uh, introduce and thank Patrick Alexander. The book is right behind us. Patrick has done a brilliant job shepherding this book into, into life, as it were, brought it into existence, uh, pays particular attention to the physical nature of the book. It's a beautiful object, and Patrick takes special uh, uh, pleasure in that. Uh, we won't get into the question of pricing. So you should ask him. Uh, I've not been able to penetrate how book prices work. Um, <laughs> I, I want to s s uh, give the floor to Jose, who's going to spend a few minutes telling us about the special collection, Ivan Illich special collection, which, which parallels the book series, the Ivan Illich 21st century perspective book series that Patrick is uh, uh, helping to, to put together. Um, and Jose will spend a few minutes just telling us about the special collection that we managed to put together and will ha be housed at Paterno Petit before we have David. Yeah, so uh, my name is Jose Guerrero. Uh, I'm a librarian here at uh, Petit Paternal Libraries, um, formerly uh, interim uh, rare book curator um, over just next doors, our special collections. Um, no longer, but uh, one of my final acts um, in that position was to help uh, bring in uh, uh, a, a real um, delightful collection of uh, original manuscript um, and collected uh, materials related to uh, Ivan Illich um, and his, his work and his life. Um, it's it's, it's uh, forthcoming. Um, the collection has not yet been cataloged. Um, so uh, don't, you know, go breaking down the door trying to get in to look at the stuff uh, right away. But it's... Uh, uh, it's, it, it contains a number of uh, notes um, and uh, thoughts, commentaries. Uh, in going over the, the, the material uh, with Sajay earlier this year, um, it, was, it was quite interesting to see how prolifically uh, Illich corresponded with his colleagues, soliciting feedback on his works, and his colleagues would write back, of course. Um, and so I think it's going to be a, a wonderful primary source on uh, the reception of Illich's work um, and its dissemination and circulation. Uh, really from the people who were active in producing and, and co-producing it. Um, it's, uh, it, I mean, it, it, it has uh, multitudes of uh, research possibilities, we believe, uh, that uh, we look forward to helping you to um, take advantage of and use in your own research or in the research of your students uh, to suggest that they come here if they're interested uh, in studying the uh, primary materials related to Illich and his, 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 his work. Um, and I would also just, you know, say uh, it, it complements quite nicely a collection that uh, is already uh, here, thanks uh, in no small part to uh, Carl Mitchum um, and others who are here in the 80s who had the foresight when these books were first being published to put those uh, original editions um, uh, and translations uh, in their sort of original forms in the special collections library for posterity. Um, and so working with rare books and manuscripts, uh, I think the trickiest thing is to know what is going to have enduring research value. Um, and it's not always apparent when something is a mass market paper book that it's gonna stand the test of time, right? Um, and yet uh, there are a number of editions and translations annotated by Illich. So I really see this collection, which, uh, which I've been working on with uh, Sajay, as uh, an extension of these sort of notes and sort of things that were 
um, sort of in the ether, very ephemeral, and that have now been brought together and are going to uh, create some kind of resonance here, I believe, around the study of, of, of Illich. So uh, it really was an honor to sort of have a first peek into that. I, I really feel quite privileged, especially since I probably know the least about Illich of all the people in this room, right? Uh, I, I'm, I'm not a, 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 an Illich scholar by any means, but um, I do certainly recognize uh, the value of these materials, and I look forward to seeing them uh, described um, and made accessible to uh, you and whoever you may suggest come here. So thanks so much uh, for being here, and uh, yeah, look thank, forward to everything. Thank you very much, Jose. Um, it's been two plus years, and I'm grateful in particular to Jose, who leaves us, <coughs> leaves Penn State in January, right? Uh, You're, June. In June. You're, yeah. And so this is one of the last things he was able to do, for which I'm particularly grateful. Which also reminds me that we're in negotiation to get the microfiche collection of Valentina Boreman, who is a, who is a longtime colleague and, and companion of Illich, and who's helped to shepherd this text, these bunch of texts, into, into print. Um, and and we can't, I can't um, talk about the book or our, our being here without due homage to Valentina. With that said, David, you're on the hook. <laughs> David has a 300,000 word manuscript You've book. You've said that twice. Already. Twice. Of which we don't <laughs> hope to hear all words today, but uh, your best song. place to, to give us a, a bird's eye view on the man, the ideas, and, and the person. Please. My talk is only 200,000 words. <laughs> <laughs> um, can everybody hear me all right? Yeah, yeah. See me all right? So if I just sit, it's good. Um, so Sajay has tasked me with an introduction to Illich, whom uh, I have scrupulously referred to as Illich in my book, but I'll call him Ivan in this company where many people knew him as Ivan, um, if that's all right. Uh, and I thought what I would do is just tell you his story as I understand it, which is a kind of context for this book since um, most of these essays are drawn from the period 1955 to 1973. There's one from 85, but yeah. otherwise it ends at 73. So they mostly <laughs> come from that period. So I thought I would just tell you the story. Uh, I know there are some people here who know it, but I think there are quite a few who don't. So here goes. Um, Ivan Illich was born in Vienna in 1926. His mother was the daughter of a assimilated Jewish businessman who had uh, extensive timber holdings in Bosnia, so a very <coughs> prosperous um, and wealthy man. And his father was uh, from Split, Spalatoy, uh, on the Dalmatian coast in what was then Yugoslavia when Ivan was born and is today Croatia. Uh, they, they had an island of uh, estates on the island of Brac, wine producing estates, and possessed patents of nobility from the Doge of Venice that go back to the early 18th century. So I guess you could say merchant aristocracy. Um, this was an ill-fated marriage at the time at which it was contracted. I've very little has survived about the personal relationship between the two, but it certainly was clear that his marriage to a, a Jew, although she was a Christian, uh, was difficult during a period in which there was a rising tide of anti-Semitism uh, in that, in Yugoslavia generally, and in which uh, the Yugoslavian government took uh, Ivan's grandfather to court over his timber leases in Bosnia. So one hardly knows what went on, and Ivan never really spoke about it. And his mother left a memoir, which is in the, mu the Jewish Museum in Washington, but it's not explicit on many of these points. But in any case, he lived in Split, the family, he and his two twin brothers, uh, with their parents and for six years. And in 1932, they left. Mother. Ivan and the, his twin younger brothers back to Grandpapa's magnificent Art Nouveau villa in the Putzlandorf section of Vienna. 
where he lived until 1941. But trouble was brewing in Austria. Uh, they were all right for a while after the Anschluss because Grandpapa paid bribes, which Ivan sometimes carried to Nazi officials, and, and uh, also because his father had some diplomatic status until he died in 1940. But eventually their status flipped from half Aryans to half Jews, and uh, there were a complicated politics about this magnificent house, uh, which was, the, the Nazis wanted it. Uh, Marta Goebbels, the wife of Joseph Goebbels, particularly coveted it, mm. and so there was a lot of to do around the house. Eventually, Ivan says in his interviews with me, they slipped out of uh, Vienna. Well, they did get a trainload of furnishings, according to one of his brothers, to Trieste. So what they were able to live on was what they could salvage from the house. They went via split to Florence in 1941 as exiles. And he, he spent the next years there. He was, after the war, educated in Salzburg and then at the Gregorian University in Rome, where I think the particularly the man who became Cardinal uh, Montini and then Pope Paul VI had his eye on Ivan as a, a likely uh, man for the church bureaucracy. He was brilliant, he was easily mastered languages, mm. and so a career was mapped out for him in the Roman church, but he, uh, he also studied uh, the works of Thomas Aquinas with Jacques Maritain during those years in Rome when Maritain was ambassador to the Vatican. Uh, Ivan wanted to get out of Rome. He wanted to get out of all the politics. And so he emigrated to the U.S., um, I think basically with the shirt on his back, in 1951, sailing from Bremerhaven to New York, intending to do a postdoc at Princeton on the work on alchemy and the work of Albert the Great. That was a big interest of his, and in fact, careful readers of his work will see alchemy as a, as a kind of never-developed theme uh, in, in his account of modernity. It gives great importance to alchemy. Anyway, he never got to Princeton because the first night he was in New York at a dinner at his grandfather, uh, friends of his grandfather's, he heard about the Puerto Rican migration and everyone tut tutting about these brown people who were running around in upper Manhattan. And he got fascinated, went up to their market, and uh, immediately went to see Cardinal Spellman and asked for an appointment to a parish in Washington Heights, uh, where the, which was the heart of the Puerto Rican migration. So within days, really, he was an assistant curate in Incarnation Parish in Washington Heights. The church is still there. And he became a, a great advocate for the Puerto Ricans in the American church because they were being treated uh, by the Irish and the Italians, <laughs> just the way the Irish and the Italians had been formerly treated. Uh, but they were more exotic in a certain way. Uh, uh, and there's a wonderful, in one of the essays in the book that you have, um, the American Parish, mm. there's, a, there's a portrait of a, Puerto Rican, a young Puerto Rican man standing outside this neo-Gothic pile. And you feel the, how forbidding it is, how cold it is, how completely unlike the sort of open air folk Christianity that a lot of these people had come from and that Ivan particularly admired. So he, he threw himself into this as he threw himself into everything in his life, traveling in Puerto Rico, horseback, on foot, getting to know all these rural areas and so on, and be, you know, also making the Puerto Ricans as best he could at home in the Paris church. And this all culminated in 1955 in a gigantic San Juan fiesta in the, in the quadrangle of Fordham University, um, where he had allies. Um, and so he, had, he actually 
toured the streets in a sound truck, as you would hear if you were visiting in Mexico, right? He's getting, beating the bushes, getting people out. So this was a great triumph. And uh, Cardinal Spellman, who was, who was a arch conservative in certain ways, I mean, notoriously blessed the bombers that bombed Vietnam and so on, was a, an ardent American patriot, but he loved Ivan, seemingly, and admired what he had done. He made him the youngest monsignor in his diocese and appointed him vice rector of the Catholic University in Puerto Rico. So there Illich established the first of a number of institutes uh, basically to train priests from New York, but also firefighters, police occasionally, uh, in Spanish language, but also in Puerto Rican poetry, culture, history. Uh, and so at this point, from 56 on, he begins to develop a philosophy of mission, a missiology, as this one says, um, which really stressed missionary poverty poverty of spirit. I mean, that would be the shortest possible description of it in, as one encounters another culture. So he, he began to develop that theme in his thought. Uh, he lasted till 59 in Puerto Rico when he was thrown off the island by his bishop uh, because the church took a stand in the election in Puerto Rico in 1959 <coughs> against the sale of birth control in drugstores. Uh, that, that, that any Catholic, you know, Catholics were forbidden to support the party of birth control. And he intervened uh, on the other side and was eventually expelled from Puerto Rico by Bishop McManus um, for doing that. So the next chapter be opens in Mexico, uh, where he and some colleagues at Fordham, uh, very notice, notably a man called Joe Fitzpatrick, who was professor at Fordham, I don't suppose much remembered now, but he was Ivan's close friend and colleague, and, and also wrote about the Puerto Rican uh, migration to New York. So they established a center there. The context here is that a Marinol priest called John Considine had convinced Pope Pius the before John the twenty third. Pope Paul VI. Twelve. <coughs> Pius the twelfth. Mm -hmm. Twelve. Yeah, yeah. So he had convinced Pius the twelfth, then John the twenty third, and later Paul the sixth, that the Latin American Church was in crisis, that it needed badly the help of the American Church, and finally it was established that the American church would send fully 10%, like, so a tithe, 10% of its strength to Latin America as a missionary effort. And so other two elements of context, the Alliance for Progress was then launched by John Kennedy as a, an aid and security for the Americas program. And the UN shortly afterwards declared the development decade. So Ivan establishes this center in Cuernavaca, which became CEDOC eventually, although it was initially mainly known under the name of CIF, the Center for Intercultural Formation, to train missionary priests. So there was a certain amount of ambivalence in what this was for. Was it to drive away the missionary priests or to train them? And he, he was, um, there was a certain amount of realpolitik I think at that time, let's let's just say that. Um, but the, it was a very, it, the course did turn away a number of missionaries. Illich's analysis very briefly was that American Catholicism didn't fit in Latin America and the aid to Latin America was attended, intended to prop up a dysfunctional church there which catered mainly to elites and was politically conservative. So a dysfunctional church helping a dysfunctional church was his view in brief. Uh, and I think he, they were more and more explicit about it as the 60s went on. And I guess we could say that a, a culminating moment, and it connects to the 
book occurred in 1967, uh, when Ivan, first of all, published an essay that he had drafted as early as 1959, and then published it in the Journal of the Thomas More Society of Chicago, the critic, called The Vanishing Clergyman. And that essay called for a complete declericalization of the church. It called for a completely different idea of the church, for a new church, in fact. And uh, I mean, it represented the, the thinking that he'd been, he'd been doing for 10 years or 15 years. But it, his essential view of the church made a very rigorous distinction between what he called the church as she and the church as it. So the church as a mystery of the kingdom, different images he would use, the pearl, a pearl found in a net, treasure found in a field, a divine bud that will flower in eternity, a sign lifted up amongst the nations. He spoke in that vein, but he spoke of the church as a sociological object in extreme. In, in ways that were very unusual in the church at that time. The church as it, the church as a multinational corporation on a par with the Chase Manhattan Bank and General Motors. These, are at, these actually are from the opening lines of that essay, The Vanishing Clergyman, which is in the book. And the second essay that he published, which is also in the book in that year, was called The Seamy Side of Charity. It was published in the Jesuit journal America, and it was a no-holds-barred attack on the American missionary effort. And I don't want to be tedious about this, but a book was published a couple of years ago by a, a man called Todd Harch, called The Prophet of Cornavaca, in which Ivan is called repeatedly anti-missionary. I think this is dead wrong. So he was against the American missionary effort in Latin America as it related to the Alliance for Progress, as it related to development, not against mission. He's, he is clear in another essay in this book, I think also the, the American Parish, the one I alluded to earlier, that, uh, that mission is an obligation of a Christian insofar <clears throat> as that person possesses good news, they would be most uncharitable not to try and share it. So he doesn't, he's not against mission, he's against a gigantic corporate establishment uh, in the context of another corporate establishment. But anyway, he was not well understood. Um, matters came to a head when Cardinal Spellman died at the end of 1967. So Spellman was his protector. Uh, Spellman was a powerful figure in the American church at that time. And um, all hell broke loose, really. Uh, so in 1968, Ivan was summoned to Rome. He was, uh, he was given a scurrilous questionnaire in four sections, erroneous opinions against the church. You know, it was, it was really a horrible document. Uh, it was, Ivan said that he recognized uh, stuff from his CIA files, which someone had leaked to him. But certainly it came, the rest of it came from the Mexican right, from Opus Dei, and he had, I mean, I have, I'm telling this story very quickly. He, there was a lot of, CEDOC was involved <coughs> in important ways in radical movements in Latin America. The first movements that created liberation theology were under the auspices of SIF. Ivan himself was not, was favored a strict separation of church and politics, in fact, but he, but he was nevertheless involved in many radical currents. Um, Brazilian emigres, when, when, the, when the government was overthrown in 64 and the junta established itself in Brazil, Paulo Freire, uh, Francisco Juliao, the peasant leader, they took refuge in Cuernavaca. So the place, and he also reported physical attacks at certain times. So it was a controversial place and a, in the center of a political struggle. So he summoned to Rome, faced with this questionnaire. You know, it's Inquisition. 
and it's the Holy Office, which is descended from the actual Inquisition, uh, that did that began this proceeding against him. He looked at it, said, "No, I won't answer those questions," um, and was the next day dismissed by Cardinal Sieper, who was the head of the Holy Office, with words that Ivan later recognized as the words of the Grand Inquisitor when he sends. Well, some of you know the Grand Inquisitor, I see. Uh, it's, it's a story that's in part of the Brothers Karamazov, uh, it, which imagined by Ivan Karamazov, he says as a poem. But in it, Jesus returns to Seville during the Inquisition. He's arrested. The next day, the Inquisitor sends him away and says, get going and don't come back. And this is what Cardinal Sieper also said to Ivan. So he left Rome, went back to Cornavaca, and the following year, an, an interdict, a ban, was placed on the center. So Sidak by now is a kind of, not just a language school and a missionary training center, but it's a kind of free university. It uh, was one of the remarkable institutions of the 1960s. And I think Ivan, one of the things that's interesting about him is that he he shows the 1960s in a rather a different light than they're often now shown. So the, the ban was the final straw. He wrote uh, to his new uh, uh, superior in New York and said that he would withdraw absolutely from all church office. He never ceased to be a priest. He, um, he never renounced his priesthood. He simply said he would not ever act for the Roman Church uh, again, unless they were once again pleased with him. So he, he left the church, in effect. He didn't leave the church as a member, but he, he, he suspended the exercise of his priesthood, I guess one could say. So that begins the next chapter, which was the period in which he was... Uh, a great, a great intellectual celebrity. Um, between 1970 and 1975, he published five books, um, Celebration of Awareness, which was, there's some overlap with The Powerless Church, um, De-Schooling Society in 1971, Tools for Conviviality in 1973, Energy and Equity in 1974, and then a book first called Medical Nemesis, and then which went through several editions and ended up as Limits to Medicine in 1975. And so during this period, he, was, he described this period as one of pamphleteering, which is kind of apt and kind of not apt. It, it, certainly they were political interventions. And uh, maybe de-schooling is, is the best quick example of it. It was never really well understood by, well, at least it was not understood by a lot of readers that this was a political proposal to de disestablish education. Although he says it in the book, one of the chapters is called Why We Must Disestablish Schooling. But it was taken as an attack on schools. And I think his bigger point was that the that Education is a church, and the proof of it is that you can't get a job for which you might otherwise be qualified unless you, per you have the educational certificates, which is exactly what religious privilege consisted in uh, formerly. So he, he claimed that the school system should be, all, privilege, all such privileges should be removed from it. It should be disestablished. Uh, so uh, this was uh, this was a non-starter politically, and yet it was put forward as a political proposal, which conceivably a majority might come to agree to. And in fact, during this period, he seems to have entertained, rem at least on some days, remarkable hopes that this would actually occur, that that de-schooling was in fact imminent. Uh, and he says it a number of times, so we know now that it wasn't imminent. Um, but he thought that it, 
he thought that it was. Um, the general idea of these books, excuse me, is, uh, is limits uh, and what he calls paradoxical counterproductivity. So at the beginning of, you see it at the beginning of Tools for Conviviality, a little essay called Two Watersheds, in which he says that modern medicine at a certain moment, early 20th century, begins to be effective. It begins to actually be helpful. And then you can detect another moment, he puts it in the 1960s, when it begins, when it crosses a second watershed and begins to get in its own way. So to become counterproductive, to become paradoxically counterproductive. Um, and that's a similar thesis about education, and he never wrote a book about law, but he would have said the same thing about the institution of law. He said it very explicitly about medicine and limits to medicine in its final form. It's far from being a pamphlet. It's a very uh, ambitious scholarly essay. Um, but it says the same thing, that, th that limits have to be identified. So he used the image of a roof at one point, that the identification of a roof of technological characteristics, or technical characteristics, I think he says, under which a society can live and be happy. So limits is the dominant idea. Pamphleteering is the dominant activity. His travel schedule in those years you wouldn't believe. He just he was like a latter day Saint Paul, a jet a jet age Saint Paul. Everywhere. You know, Dusseldorf today, London tomorrow. You know, he, he just Trudeau. He yeah. Trudeau and Gandhi. Yeah, he also hobnobbed with the mighty, who all liked him but didn't really take up the idea so much. Certainly Pierre Trudeau, who was our Prime Minister in Canada, was very infatuated with Ivan. And even on one occasion, this is the story he told you to my wife who sits here, um, that, that he, he made him stay in Ottawa during a snowstorm and, send it, and said he would commandeer a military vehicle to get him to Toronto in time for his lecture, and did so. So, and he, yeah, he also was connected uh, with true pupil J. Cartu, Indira Gandhi, and so on. Anyway, this period ends symbolically with the closing of CDOC, the Center for Intercultural Documentation, in 1976. Probably in itself a remarkable act to close a, a prospering and successful institution and just say, we're done with this. Mm -hmm. But that's what happened in 76. And he at that point began a new adventure, which uh, he kind of hit the road in a different way, traveling a lot in India, in Southeast Asia, in Japan, but perhaps more as a pilgrim than as a, a jet-setting mm -hmm. lecturer. Um, and he began to, he returned to the study of history, which he kept up for the rest of his life, presenting himself mainly as an historian. Uh, and he began to investigate what he called certainties. So clearly the pamphleteering had failed, and you, you can see it with education. So he said, uh, education rests on a certainty about scarcity, that the means for our education are scarce and must be husbanded in specialized institutions. So as long as you believe that the means for us to educate ourselves are scarce, everything else will follow from it. So scarcity then is, is, is the central certainty, the idea that we don't think about because we think with it. We look and we see it. Uh, it's, the, it's the main postulate of economics. It, it applies in... in in dearth and in abundance. We are always chasing something that is inherently scarce. We'll never get there. Um, there will always be alternate uses and so on. So he, he imagined that he would write a history of scarcity. He says it in several places. He never did it, um, but he did create two very remarkable books. One called Shadow Work, 
published in 1980, and a second called Gender, which was published in 1982, which are studies in economic history, although gender was not understood to be such. Um, I mean, there are studies in many things, but they are studies in economic history, and they are contributions to a history of scarcity. But um, the story of gender is, is probably worth pausing with. How long have I been talking for? A few more minutes? Okay. Because gender was so controversial and did such an injury to his reputation. So he, um, in encounters with women scholars and historians, came to see that they said to him that what, what is generally understood as the beginning of capitalism can be understood as the demise of gender. I.e., as long as you have, so gender for him was a division of society into two subsets who were considered to be of different kinds. He claimed this was univers a universal practice. He claimed that it existed under conditions of matriarchy as well as of patriarchy, that it was not inherently a patriarchal division. It was rather a concept of how the world is um, and, and mirrors many other polarities of the same kind, time and eternity, heaven and earth, man and woman. So perhaps naively, certainly with enthusiasm, he threw himself into this study of gender as, as a tool of, ec of analysis of economic and Western history generally. And it was all done in a year during which he was at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Berlin, and then unveiled in a series of lectures at, in Berkeley, uh, the Alexander Lectures, they were called, so a prestigious lecture series involving a number of lectures in which he unveiled this hypothesis, connecting it to church history, and I, I just couldn't tell you all about it now. The book is a, Sajay admires it as much as I do, it's, a, it's a, um, an amazing seedbed of ideas. It's just a very, very rich text. But it badly offended the women of Berkeley, particularly the leading women of Berkeley. And seven feminist professors, um, after his lectures finished, organized a symposium at which essentially they denounced him and then published their lectures as a special issue of a journal called Feminist Issues. Uh, which circulated pretty widely, and in years after that, I, I again and again met people who had not read gender, who knew they disapproved of it. You know, like the people I met outside the demonstration at the Royal Ontario Museum who were boycotting it, and I said, well, what don't you like about the show? Well, we're boycotting it. <laughs> How would we know? You know so so I, I think the book got a bad uh, it, it, did, it was badly reviewed, the review in the Canadian Forum, which was headed gendered good old days, kind of catches the tone of it. Like it was like he was a romantic reactionary, seen through him, and he had thought he was contributing to a revival of the commons, a new look at economic history. I mean, the difference between what he thought he was doing and what he was understood to be doing was an amazing dialogue of the deaf. But anyway, it, did, it happened, and I think it changed, uh, it changed a lot of things. Um, but I have to be brief, so I'll just finally say that, that in a final period of his life, uh, he began to speak more again about the church. So the material that you'll find in the powerless church is, is again treated. Um, and just to be brief, uh, my first visit to State College was in 1988 when I came to interview Ivan for the CBC. And I had, I had followed him. He was very important to me. And I had followed him from 1968 on when I had been a, 
a volunteer in international development. Peace Corps, Americans would say, our organization was called CUSO. And I'd just come back to Canada, somewhat unsettled by the experience when I, someone passed me a, an essay of Ivan's, which, he had, which is also in here, which you've titled To Hell With Good Intentions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it was a talk to some young volunteers in Chicago, and it, it really lit me up. And I, I followed him very closely from then, met him at that time, but didn't really get connected till 1988 when I came down here. And at the very end of that interview, after eight days we'd been talking, so the whole book called Ivan Illich in Conversation, you can get it. Um, he says to me, you know, that I believe the history of the West can be summed up in the expression, in the old Latin adage, corruptio optimi pessima. The corruption of the best is the worst. <coughs> so the whole history of Western civilization can be summed up in... <laughs> okay. <laughs> I wasn't ready for that. I had I'd read all his books, but I, this was something new to me. And... Um, but he, that was his essential conception. In a later book called The Rivers North of the Future, he describes the hypothesis as being that modernity can be studied as an extension of church history. In lectures in Chicago at the McCormick Theological Seminary, he says that modernity is Christianity turned inside out or upside down, topsy-turvy. He used various images. So... In other words, the church is the matrix of modernity and, and is closely modeled in modern institutions. Well, that's the same idea that we had in de-schooling society, right? That the church... He, so he had been writing about it all along. In de-schooling society, he speaks of a world church. He speaks of a mechanical messiah. He, he speaks of an artificial creation. This... Understanding was always there, but it becomes much more explicit towards the end. Um, and because I was so dogged in, in trying to get him to expound this, as we, as we got to know each other better, I sort of kept at him about it. And, you know, made from then on at least annual or more than one visit to State College annually. So this is a special place for me. I'm... I should have said it at the beginning. I'm pleased and honored to be here among you because I've a lot of good things have happened to me in State College, Pennsylvania. So anyway, I just through this doggedness, I eventually convinced him to to do two more long sets of interviews, which became a posthumous book called "The Rivers North of the Future" um, that I had hoped I would get to go over with him, but it didn't happen. He was ambivalent about it. And by the time he realized he, he wanted to see it published, it was too late. So I published what I had. But that is where you will discover this hypothesis. Um, so I, I, I'll conclude by saying that, um, echoing this remark that Sajay quoted from Giorgio Agamben, who quotes it in turn from Walter Benjamin, uh, that about the hour of legibility. So I think Ivan can, can be read now uh, in a new way. Uh, it hasn't happened yet in the Roman Catholic Church, to my knowledge, where he's a very much a disregarded prophet. Uh, and I, I'll accept correction on that, but that's my view right now. But I think there, there is a, a chance now to read him and understand him in the, the view of, let's say, a new crisis of the institutions that he uh, already believed were in crisis in the early uh, 1970s and you know, have now reached a new kind of revelatory, apocalyptic, one can perhaps say, in the sense of revelatory extremity. So, uh, you know, I'm hoping that, that uh, people will want to hear more about Ivan. Thank you. Thank you, David. All right. Thank you.
usual breathtaking facility <laughs> and stitch. Well, we'll see. It's, it's a lot of complexity together in, in a key line. Um, I, I thought we could spend the next hour, which we have, in, in discussion and conversation and in picking up threads that uh, we want to hear more or less about. So, uh, people who've known a village, I know Paul, you've attended, um, might have questions, or people who are new to it might have questions. Uh, we, could, we could start a conversation and take the advantage of David being here to grill him and grill him some more. <laughs> And if, if not, if, to just get things started, it's always the first question, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, corruptio uh, optimi pessima. Yeah. The corruption of the best is worst. Uh, hold off, bracket the question of the best yeah. for a moment. Yeah. What is the, in what respect, how does one consider the contemporary moment the worst? That is to say, technologically, we're as advanced as we can get, Latest statistics on poverty are down, regardless of mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what economics might suggest, uh, of, of income inequality. Yes, there is. But um, so, so worst is a, is a strong judgment. It is a strong judgment. Um, and, I, and I wonder whether one could sort of get into the mind of, uh, or, or perhaps there are others who have a similar read of Western history. Who run parallel? Yes, so Girard, I'm for instance, uh, some elements of critical theory back in the Hawkeye days, for instance. Right. So um, perhaps you could start there to understand why this is why the judgment of the worst. Well, <sighs> Ivan begins the book that became the Rivers North of the Future with a kind of unsolicited credo. The, the, the whole book was unsolicited in a certain sense, in as much as I had again and again urged him to write this book. To, but when I arrived with my tape recorder, I had no idea what was going to be said or, or in what order it was going to be said. So he began with this, I believe. And he says that I believe the incarnation, that is the person of Jesus, uh, is, uh, is inaugurates a new flowering of love and knowledge. And it, the essence of it is the freedom to love who and where I will, or one will. And his paradigm of it, which he used again and again in teaching, is the parable of the Samaritan, right? Who's, who Ivan claimed had been completely misread through 800 years of church history as, a, as enjoining a duty. Uh, the Samaritan had taken on by then a completely different valence of the good Samaritan when in fact he's an enemy in the story, right? He's, a, he's from the northern kingdom. We have nothing to do with these people. He has nothing to do with the guy in the ditch. It's, it's positive, you know, so I think Wolfgang said last night we, we would think this was a Hamas terrorist and, a, and an Israeli soldier that are confronting here. That's, that's maybe a little strong, but, but it is, it's, it's, it's absolutely wrong for them to have any connection to each other. But instead, he stops, binds up the guy's wounds, takes him to the inn. That's a pretty well-known story. Um, but that it, he, he sees two different aspects in that story. It's at the, on the one hand, it's a liberation. New possibility is opened. It's important to him that it's a revealed possibility, so he thinks it's natural to human beings to remain within closed horizons, within parochial settings, in cultures, carefully guarded against outsiders. Um, but he says, on the other hand, it's totally threatening to that ability to live within limited horizons. It, it has the possibility to inaugurate a duty of Samaritanism. Uh, it has the capacity ability to, it has the capacity to become a law of love. So it becomes it, 
it makes possible, it enables a new, an entirely new kind of power. And that power is incarnated in the church. And it doesn't, this doesn't happen all at once. He, he attached great importance to the 12th century and to um, the institution of the confession, for example, the elaboration of the canon law, which then becomes the model for the modern states, the elaboration of law. The idea in a nutshell is that the church models the state as it will, as it will become. But what in essence is the worst is that a certain kind of freedom has been not only lost, it's been institutionalized. Mm -hmm. um, so he says, wherever I look for the roots of modernity, I find it in the attempt to guarantee, to ensure, to regulate, perhaps he says, the gospel message. So, um, yes, so we, we can understand modern institutions as a kind of packaged salvation, you might say. I mean, that's off the top of my head. But um, that's, that's the idea in general. And obviously, if you, um, you, you end up from this greatest of all surprises of the incarnation, he says, um, it, it can, it, it is a surprise, and it can exist as nothing else but a surprise. So he understands um, Christianity as beginning in a completely gratuitous event, obeying no necessity whatsoever, a free, uncompelled, mysterious, impossible to completely comprehend gift, right? So the, the more that it's regular, the more that that freedom is, submits to guarantee, to regulation, to control, to metered and promised delivery, the more the best becomes the worst. Is, is that an answer? Mm -hmm. to, to paraphrase, and then you know we'll open this, I mean, people should jump in. Uh, in a society where freedom, so I, I, let me just play a little bit. I come from India. You know, uh, in, in my backyard, whole people pray to rats, dogs, right? we, we, polytheistic societies. Freedom is not an ultimate value. No. And then you land up in, in America, freedom is an ultimate value. Yes. It's announced from every corner, every nook. Uh, Superman is free. And, ordinary people, it's, you know, for everybody, kids and infants, mm -hmm. free to choose. <laughs> um, so in a society where freedom is an ultimate value, right. it's paradoxical to see a great deal of bureaucratic order, Yes. bureaucratic regimentation, um, which is one way to read, for instance, uh, uh, kids who can play in the streets and there's no supervision back in India, for example, could be understood as just low levels of development <coughs> or could be understood as kids doing what kids do. And alternatively here, uh, did you check in, check out? Did you go through the token? Did you flash your card and so on and so forth? Um, do, you so, have, do you have a play date with another kid? Do you have a play date and then you have to yeah. submit to make sure that it was... Um, paradoxically, a society that claims constantly as an ultimate value freedom is also one characterized by extraordinary levels of, of order and regulation and rules. And, um, perhaps this as an entry point to the dynamic of best and worst. I yeah. just offer it as a, yeah. as a yeah. quick summary as opposed to more extensive. Yes, questions? Yeah, Paul, please. Uh, you go first. I have to add to the second email in the room. Ah, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, may I ask you a question? Please. Uh, what, what is it? Um, I don't do 
Uh, in addition to being an Indian, I had the experience of actually graduating from a high school that was run by American Jesuits. Okay. So, um, and I wanted to refer to your um, comment on missionary or missions in yes. Latin America versus the rest of the yes. world. You know. And one of the continual arguments we used to have, and it, it was interesting with this school, in the school out of 900 students, there was one Catholic, maybe two Christians, you know, by birth, and the rest of us were heathens. So, so the, <laughs> the, the point is, one argument we continuously got into with the, with the Padres is that, what is their mission in India, right? Yeah. And, well, to educate people, but is that selfless? So ultimately, the argument never got resolved because in the end it always became, well, conversion part is there, but we don't actively do it. But, yeah. but that's, that's why it's here. And there were other missions also, like there were Belgians and others who, who worked over there too. So I was a little curious about what Ivan's view was on the mission part. That's one, I'll ask the same question right away too. And the other question I had is last week I was in Pittsburgh and I had lived there for many years. I, I taught at the University of Pittsburgh once upon a time. And so uh, I met up with an old friend who is on the school board now of the Pittsburgh Public Schools. And this is the question on education. Uh, it wasn't clear to me whether the view here is that that it is in some way destroying the old-fashioned more one-to-one -one correspondence of education, or what would be his position on public education in that sense from whatever you can guess, because um, one of the things we were trying to discuss there is to see how we can recover public school education in districts like the Pittsburgh School District, which, right. is, which is going down here, especially in the uh, black community, this trying to help us to be an African American. So, and um, I'm, I'm just curious about where is uh, mission education. So, just so start with education. Yeah. Um, when he was made vice rector of the Catholic University in Ponce in Puerto Rico, he found himself on the school board. Which was one school board for the whole island. The whole system was under one board, and I think he he said anyway that he had. He'd had spotty schooling himself and had never given the, the, the matter really very much thought. And Puerto Rico was then a laboratory for development, right? The guy who became uh, the head of the Alliance for Progress was then the head of something called Operation Bootstrap, which was, so Puerto Rico was the laboratory of development and schooling was a centerpiece of that. So Ivan began to analyze it. Well, these kids are, and even offended his university colleagues by arguing that if, if, the, if the country's goals were to get everybody through grade six, I can't remember the details, then the, no more money to the university until, mm -hmm. you know, in fact, at that time, the Puerto Rican children were breaking the law by not getting as much schooling as the law said they, they were entitled to have. So I think his first conclusion was that it was a ludicrously inefficient way to, to use resources. That it was, and that it was a lottery in which the poorest would lose. Because who was going to get to the top of the greasy pole? When I was teaching in Sarawak, I, I mentioned as when I was a CUSA volunteer, there were, Maybe five people from the country went to universities in Canada and Russia. But aspiration was focused at this summit, right? So I think he, he came to a lot of conclusions about it. He, he, he recognized it as, he said, ridiculously similar to a, r a religious situation, right? That this appeared to him to behave as a church. But he also had many practical arguments about its efficiency about, and about justice, uh, which he assembled first into an article called The Futility of Schooling in Latin America, and then into uh, the de-schooling society. Um, 
So does that say a little bit about how he how he saw it? I mean, <coughs> how could you conceive of that childhood education that's like this? Well, I think he he first was in favor of an educational world, if one can put it that way, a world which is available to children from which they can learn. Every, anyone who has any experience with children knows that that they're curious, <laughs> that they want. You know, I mean, uh, we we had a guy who came to our house. What was he doing? He was he was checking the furnace, and he he believed that you that you needed to be taught to walk. I think. I mean, he 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 had an amazing idea of what teaching or that everything is all learning is a result of teaching. So no teaching, no learning. Uh, so Ivan had the opposite view. Almost no learning is a result of teaching, in his opinion. He had a very elevated view of the, the master-pupil relation, or mistress-pupil relationship, <coughs> right? That is, he, he believed that if you wanted to learn something, you would certainly need to submit to discipline in order to learn it. And you, you would need to, to a, in a certain way, give up your will in the matter also. You could not. But, but that should be a matter of decision based on aptitude, based on circumstances, not. So he, I mean, you know, I, I went through a New England prep school where my father was a master because um, he emigrated to the States. Um, and I, I think it wasn't really till I met Ivan or began to read him that I thought it through. But it's amazing how many people graduate from school with an anti-intellectual attitude. Yeah. <laughs> the great majority of my classmates were made anti-intellectual by the schooling procedure. Uh, and that's remarkable, I think, right? It really, so, he thought there would be another way to do it. <clears throat> that there might be numerous other ways to do it. Uh, and especially in a place like Puerto Rico, where there weren't, where, you know, the, the, the dropouts would be severely punished, right? But he, he also claimed that to be a dropout then is a, it's a new self-inflicted injury, right? Not only are you poor, but you're now responsible for your, your own, you're responsible in a way, right? Because, well, you don't have enough schooling. It's pretty obvious, duh. And so, so I mean, I, I'm going on, but that, that was how he thought. Now, on the mission question, how did he think of mission? Um, I think, above all, he didn't want to see the Latin American church as it was propped up by American priests, right? And he didn't like the attitude of the American church that it was God's gift and we'll come and we'll build schools and we'll, you know. So it was, it was the involvement with development, thinking, and it was also the nature of the Latin church. He was... He was an, um, an admirer from his days in Salzburg of, of folk Christianity, different vernacular forms of Christianity were of great interest to him. And Valentina's, his friend Valentina's microfiche collection is all this crazy stuff she collected throughout Latin America, the actual uh, spiritual life of, in, 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 yeah. So um, you'd have been in favor of the Merino people, for example, Merino sisters in the in Central America, or, or the I think he was. You, know? you had mentioned American theology. Yeah, I think he was very much against certain Merino priests who he felt were were <coughs> were meddling where they had no business in in Guatemala. In Guatemala. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a complicated story. Yeah. Guatemala. I don't, I don't want to speak about it. 
<laughs> casually. But um, but so I think his he he would have said uh, just as with education that the mission is a matter of vocation. If you actually are called to do something, then go and do it. Uh, and do it uh, with respect, not not as a massive invading force, right? So. Not like last classes in Central America. Yeah. Yeah. So. David, can you say that Illich himself exhibited this? I mean, he was a missionary. He was a totally a missionary, yeah. I would say, and in but his he, understanding never, of mission. He never preached to you. He never he, preached. But he he exhibited it. He exhibited rather, it. Rather, and, rather than, and that's the way he talked about it. And I would say he, in, in, I mean, in the end of The Vanishing Clergyman, this controversial essay I mentioned, he, he calls for priests willing to live uh, the ordinary life of tomorrow's priest today, and to live outside the church, uh, to live as a priest outside the church and outside any religious structure. And I think that what Carl says is exactly true. He, he, he started, if you want to say it, he started churches wherever he went. But they weren't, they didn't look much like churches. Yeah. But, but in many instances, they did have the effect of bringing people into the church. I mean, I think of somebody like Celia and Matthias, you know, joined the church as an influence. Yes, he wasn't at all anti-church. I mean, it, it's hard to speak about somebody whose thought is, is, is in, to me, in a good sense, contradictory, right? He, he affirms tradition and he affirms freedom together. And he, he even claims that tradition is the, is, is the foundation of freedom, right? So he honors the church. He considers himself an obedient son of the church. He says this in letters to superiors. At the same time, he's obviously a rebel. He's obviously not obedient at all. So this paradoxical, contradictory, I don't know quite how to say it, character, I think is is a condition of freedom, but it's it was not well understood, right? He was not understood as an obedient <laughs> son of the church, even though he claimed that he was. So, yeah, Carl. In, in your studies, what do you think triggered, or what was in his background that, that as a consummate insider, he thought, okay, I'm going to missionary should be eliminated. Educational system should be eliminated. What what brought that out in him? What kind of answer could I give to that? <laughs> he was a fatherless. If I was a Freudian, I'd say he was a fatherless boy. <laughs> um, he, I think, love of freedom. Isn't that true? He he took. Yeah. Freedom was the highest virtue. So, and he saw people oppressed in institutions that he thought it was not necessary. So, so he, saw, he, he felt for these young Puerto Ricans who he felt were being sold a bill of goods. Uh, that, w that, they, that the school would lead to the heavenly city when it was going to lead to them being dropouts. Uh, and, and having a new interiorized sense of guilt for not having made it in a system that was rigged against them. So love is one of the answers, love or sympathy or feeling for others. But love of freedom is a huge part of it. But, but he also said he felt worse for the people who made it through the system, who thought that somehow they were superior <laughs> yeah. Yeah. because of yeah. it. So, <laughs> they were even more deluded. Yeah. But how is this not a council of rampant anarchy? That is to say, <coughs> if you deinstitutionalize, like university systems, hospitals, schools, uh, the techno economic is built on corporations, on, on solid structures. And here's this guy talking about freedom 
which implies a kind of de uh, implies that not implies states deinstitutionalization, right. which is one step away from we can do what the heck you want, and that is a short definition of anarchy. Right. And this is the idea of freedom. Well, it seems to me in any exercise in social criticism, the easiest way to refute it is to just simply, by subtraction, you say, okay, you're going to take the school out, now what's going to happen? You won't have any schools, all the people, the children will watch television all the time. That's not, a, that's a non-starter, right? Forget that. So, but things don't, don't change like that, right? They don't. You don't take something out. So could you? You don't simply de-school society. I mean, it was a it was a it was a catchy expression, but de-schooling society implied de-clericalizing the church, de-legalizing the law. I mean, it was a it was a an image for a for a way of thinking, a way of acting, um, which is much closer to the ground, right? And and is much more attuned to what emerges from each individual interaction, each each event, each incident. I mean, it's it's a one step at a time, close to the ground philosophy. So I don't know if you can really theorize about about trying to imagine a society without schools or something. Yes, a little different because I think what's we are embedded in layers and layers of structure, whether it's yeah. from the kindergarten to you know university and so on. So I would, I guess, my thinking is more like what contributions from his writings can one use in the world today to make changes and in fact change what freedom as far as education is concerned because it's not what. It's not a binary situation, given yeah. the structures that exist. So. Well, given I mean, what kind of moment it was in the later 60s and yeah. early 70s, we leave aside. Some, some people were there and will remember that it was an interesting atmosphere. There was the possibility to think maybe you could re do it do it now so we leave that aside so now i would say that first book of 1970 celebration of awareness is is a key idea right that you can think you can always free your imagination you can always think differently you can always stop lying um, and so, and you, I mean, you can still make enclaves of conviviality within institutions, right? There's, it, it seems to me it applies on many levels. It, it isn't just all or nothing, right? So that failed, now we're up shit creek, nothing to say about it, right? It seems to me that the ideas and the way of thinking that he, that I got from him, let's put it that way, is 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 pertinent, right? And 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 could be adopted by anyone as a way of looking <coughs> at the circumstances that they're in and what they might do in those circumstances and and so on. Paul, you you wanted to? Yeah. So let me begin by saying thank you for this overarching view of the thought of Ivan Illich. For somebody like me who read one book in the 1970s, Peace Building Society, and then to come for this seminar, I decided to go to Wikipedia. So that's my level of knowledge, and I really appreciate the, the detailed picture you painted. And uh, I don't have a question per se, but a, an observation that when Ivan Illich was writing about limits, and limits being an important theme. And in the 70s, there was a kind of uh, an explosion of limits explanations. So yes. 
Yeah. Deschooling Society in Education. In 1973, I believe, the Stockholm Conference on the Environment was formed talking yeah. about limits of Earth yes. systems. Right. At the same time, in economics, there was limits to growth. And so we were kind of looking at all these limits, and they were in many ways real. And uh, so my first thought was, like, what was going on in the 70s that we realized that there are all these limits? And I suspect it's all linked to population. The population had grown in the prior 20 years, uh, almost tripled by the mid 1970s. And people are starting to see that we are at some kind of an edge or a boundary. And in many cases, we have crossed that boundary and we are in a crisis. And the response to crisis is often transformation of the entire system to a new norm. Uh, proposing freedom as a solution to me sounds very problematic now because it is the genesis of these crises and limits is also in freedom. Freedom to produce from children to products and then to consume. The freedom to simply sort of arrogate to the human species a much larger proportion of what is available on planet Earth. And now with the knowledge 30, 50 years later that uh, these limits are real and somehow we need to curtail these freedoms. The solution has to lie in some sensible and equitable and just way of curtailing freedoms, not in opening that box even further. So I'd like to hear what might Ivan think about this sort of uh, approach, which limits rather than... Well, I have to come back to a contradiction or pairs of opposites. So tools, uh, tools for conviviality uh, links freedom and limits. Freedom, it isn't, those aren't, those are the two sides of the same coin. They're, they may be contradictory, but freedom will only be possible, he claims, within limits. So I don't think freedom and limit can be opposed to each other in his way of thinking. And perhaps, and perhaps you can add a phenomenological dimension to freedom here, right? So if you take the concrete example of cars, in energy and equity argues freedom and limits. The freedom to walk is possible only if you put a limit on the speed of cars. Now, to confuse freedom and say, I'm sitting in a car and I'm going somewhere, when you're being carried like a package, is to have an impoverished understanding of freedom in, within, this, within this understanding, right? So freedom to do, I can do by myself, I can walk. For a car, I need money, I need, I'm dependent. If you make that the criterion of motion, then you'll arrange society in such a way where the guys who have cars can move, the rest are walking across bridges under things, right? Um, and so freedom to act yeah. can only so I, be possible within certain limits. I, I, I mean, I, Ivan belonged to that political philosophy that, uh, which I guess you would say Gandhi, Fritz Schumacher, Leopold Kaur. The, the scale issue is absolutely mm -hmm. crucial for him, right? Mm -hmm. Kaur says whenever something's wrong, something is too big. And it's, it's, it's an interesting observation. And certainly Ivan held that. So you can only begin to think of freedom uh, on a scale on which you can actually exercise it. Uh, so I think Maybe a worldwide ecocracy is the only way to prevent the seas from boiling. Yeah, I mean, that uh, you could argue it, but he's not, that's not his line of territory. He says, I mean, if 
if Ivan were, let's, let's take the global warming climate change theme. So he, one of the interesting things in, in Tools for Conviviality is that he, he, he lays out what he calls conditions for recovery. And one of the conditions, so this is uh, the ability of people to access the law is one. The recovery of, 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 of language is a second. So to be able to really mint my own language and know what I'm talking about when I speak rather than having my speech be inhabited by a thousand ghosts. Um, obviously it's an ideal. And the third is, is to get over the delusion about science. So he says that modern societies are stunned by a delusion about science. And what he means is not that he's against science, but that he's against science taking up the whole space. So common sense, obviously for people to live politically together, they must be able to exercise common sense judgment. Otherwise, you just ask the guy with the white coat on. He'll tell you. Um, so this delusion must be ended. So now, the figure of climate change, which is into which all kinds of apocalyptic fear is projected and which may be true, is to, to follow that discourse, you need to place immense faith in models of a, a complexity that, that's unimaginable, right? The, the models that are used to project that this and this will happen or that and that will happen are, are highly, are unbelievably complex. They model something unthinkable the atmosphere, right? So his, his whole approach would have been just to sidestep that, I think, to say, look, just live properly and let the chips fall where they may, right? Uh, it's, it's, it's the scale on which you live. It's the standard to which you hold yourself on. It's, it, yeah. So, so, so this Trent, the just to say. That yeah. you don't live by yourself, that you live in an interconnected world where even your freedom to breathe impinges on other people's freedom to breathe. Such fundamental things like air are now endangered. And so if we think only at our individual scale or our community scale and not at a planetary scale, we are somehow missing a very fundamental connection between the freedoms that we practice and, and their availability to all. And he probably had a pretty sophisticated explanation of the relationships among freedoms, or a, freedom, a type of freedom but distributed across the human race and other species. And I'm trying to figure that out and, and, and out of this conversation, whether there are limits, or does he conceptualize of a planetary limit to the kinds of freedoms that we should be enjoying or, or I, I, I think what Paul is talking about is best uh, answered by saying that, in my mind, the notion of social morphology is completely understated. Uh, it's inherent in many of his writings, certainly in the footnotes of gender, yeah. which I found more exciting so maybe you could comment about social morphology. Well, I mean, when he says that a community cannot, in a gender, in under under a regime of vernacular gender, yeah, a community yeah. cannot outgrow its size. I mean, he took he took yeah all right social morphology. He took ideas from Leopold Kor, from Darcy Thompson. Uh, on on, on JBS Haldane on being the right size. What's Darcy Thompson's work called? Growth and form. Growth and form. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he definitely felt that each thing has its proper size and scale, right? And that, um, 
you know, yeah, things obey their, should obey their proper scale. So, you know, there's a limit to how much people can, how many people you can know, what you, you know, so to think, he, he, he simply said, if you know, to think on a planetary scale, as you just said. He said, if you think on a planetary scale, the time for human beings is over, right? It's that's he 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 could not comprehend how the vanity of thinking on a planetary scale how would is compatible in any way with the posture in which he wanted to live. He just, I think he, he was clear about it, no? Yeah. I mean, it's not so much he wanted to live. I think it was a social diagnosis that if, if things exceed a certain scale, mm -hmm. it would reach techno-scientific, it would spell its own doom, which is where we are now. Right. And, <coughs> and I'm, I'm not sure that the remedy lies at the scale at which problem has been caused. That is to say, uh, just think of the global economy. It is not controllable by anybody. Um, now to conceive of ways to put limits on growth would require intolerable levels of, I, I would imagine, intolerable levels of political <coughs> herding. If you want to put limits on, on growth now at that scale, that is to say, if you take the technological, techno-economic as given, then the only way to control it is, is it seems to me, herding people. As you say, put limits, but the limits will function as, as treating people like cattle. You have to, at that scale. One million Bangladeshi slowly walking into the borders of India. What are you going to do? Have a conversation? No. Yeah. I'm Bengali by birth. <laughs> so that, <laughs> that, all, all the Mexicans here now. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I think because Paul had raised also the issue of consumerism. I believe you said something. The freedom to consume. And perhaps not. Somewhat ironically, your example was a consumer model after all, driving in a car, you know. I was thinking of of, of the majority of the world's population that probably hasn't seen a car in long years, you know. So so that would not be a, a choice of freedom. But but obviously there's an ethical foundation to whatever he says. I think that's something I think if we get to a particle about it then we lose that actually. Yes. And 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 otherwise, one can say that inequality is one of the greatest freedoms on this earth, right? <laughs> to, 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 to engender and f further inequality at all levels. So uh, I don't think he's at all su he's suggesting the opposite in most ways. So freedom, I think we often fail to recognize that freedom works on a vertical scale, which is, I think, what what you are saying, in other words, not everybody is free to to not breathe polluted air, depending on where you live. You cannot just all walk away from there, you know. Uh, and so, our choices are very limited in that. And I think that that's and and after all, we are the only species that can actually uh, bring about our own extinction. Nothing in the world is ever done that, you know. So, so those are when, so when you talk about freedom, those concern me. I guess like what, yeah, we are free to end the world too. That's not what we're talking about. Yeah. There's, so there's an ethical foundation there. I think. So. <coughs> yeah. Well, we're talking about a Christian. Right. Who who is, someone said, was always a missionary. Yeah. And and I mean. How practical is the New Testament? Or not yet, <laughs> Mary. I just wanted to know, did you know a story? 
Uh, you didn't tell us what you were doing in St. Cottage. Was he a missionary here? Or was he a missionary? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I, I think uh, Ivan mostly steered by friendship. So he knew Rusty Roy, who started the SDS program here, and Rusty suggested he come here, and I think that's the beginning here. And it, it was a place where he could do what he wanted to do, which he, he said that, you know, his relation to the university was to soberly milk that sacred cow. <laughs> and and he, so he, he felt that the important things went on at the margins, so he was able, through his teaching here, to fund these living room consultations that went on between 85 and 95, 96 which were, you know, which I came down for regularly, which people, uh, other people will remember them. Uh, they weren't always successful, but they were always an attempt to bring people together, to start new friendships, which I think was the most important thing to him, right, was that, that intellectual life be integrated with social life if you want to say that, like the, the, the people would meet in smaller groups, that they would, they would come to love each other even as they, you know, that the university itself was a, an institution founded on a kind of separation of ascetic or spiritual <coughs> disciplines and intellectual disciplines. So the university had needed fundamentally to be come back to itself, a kind of unity had to be restored. And, and that was what was going on in various houses on Foster Avenue and Fairmount Avenue. So, so really what you're saying is that he was trying to reform things within the system. He wasn't an iconoclast, he was a somebody who liked the overall things like the church, the university, etc. But he wanted to revolutionize it with, from within. Is that what you're trying to say? I mean, he wanted what he did to make a difference to the university. Well, I, I think by the... I, 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 We're all looking to Kaylee. How do you I, answer this? I, I think um, something I didn't say and, and meant to say was that Ivan, sometime in the early 80s, came to the conclusion that the world had changed in a way that he hadn't expected. Uh, that really people had entered quite different mental space than the people, I mean, that, those are obviously ideal types, but, but essentially that an age of the, um, maybe an 800 year age of the world was ending in our time. That an age of text, of tools, was being overcome and drowned by an age of systems. So, I think after the early 80s, he had no particular intention to revolutionize anything or to, to, to be once again a pamphleteer. I think he, he devoted himself, uh, you, you might say it was a more of a neo-monastic ideal if you understood that it would necess not necessarily have anything to do with monasteries as they were, right? But it, it would be a similar function, not, not a similar shape or structure of institution. So I think these were, these were communities formed against the dark in many ways. So. Uh, this is related to Mary's question, but while he was coming to Penn State, he was also going to the University of Pennsylvania. Yeah. And those of us who had some friends in the University of Pennsylvania <clears throat> were, I guess, surprised because he, at, at UPenn, the conversations were much more architectural because he was there mm -hmm. with Joseph Rich Reichler. Yeah. And, um, and the faculty was predominantly architectural. So when he came up here, he seemed to have 
been charged up by uh, some of the themes that he encountered <coughs> there, which uh, we found refreshing because we didn't see it in his previous writings. He seemed to be uh, just like the best student in the class. He had learned something the previous 24 yeah. hours that he was now <laughs> lecturing on. Oh, okay. uh, but I, I wonder, it was, it was not a part of your um, hmm. account. I just wondered if, if you knew anything about that connection. Well, I, I knew I I remember his love for Joseph Redward, and um, and but no, I, I don't know. I, I I probably don't know a great deal about what what went on in those when he taught it in architecture. Were you there? You could probably tell no, me. I just knew a lot of people at Penn at the time. Okay. But it is, it is out of those reflections that the unpublished we've got a sitting on a bunch of unpublished papers that are sadly published in other languages. Some of it. Uh, on the history of the senses, and I think it's in conversation with Rickwood. For instance, I, even before he goes to Rickwood, he publishes H2O and the Waters of Forgetfulness, right. which is, if you look at the footnotes, a meditation on historical spaces, the Roman, African, and so on and so forth, right. and the relationship, phenomenology of body and space. And, and, and built in by the idea of the town. The idea yeah. of the town. So yeah. that's the yeah. basis of the connection. And then I think Illich moves in the direction of history of the senses, touch, hearing, seeing, uh, voice, whereas uh, Rickwood will then publish the dancing columns, yeah, which become also. very, very central, right? You, you, you were there as well. Yeah. You knew all of that stuff. Yeah. Well, I mean, but, but I, I agree with you. I mean, I, I went with him to some of the, the uh, Okay. The conversations with Rickward, and uh, it wasn't energized. He did he, he, what you describe is exactly my experience of him too. He was much more energized there than he would bring back here uh, right. in these discussions. Architect. He was wholesale there and retail. Here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had the, uh, the the pleasure of shuttling. Yvonne and Lee between Philadelphia and, and the State one. College <laughs> during that time for two, about two years. Uh, but you're, you're absolutely right. And uh, I, that was during the dancing uh, column and the proportionality conversations that were really starting to develop. Right, and the fest trip for Joseph was uh, a little bit after that, but it involved a lot of themes that were of that period. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so these two can tell you more. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I, can't about that. I do remember Joe Record telling me, he said to me, because he'd had a little trouble getting in touch, he said, wherever Yvonne is, he'll always give you three phone numbers, each one with one digit wrong. It's pretty apt, no? Yeah. So, there's the, the dyslexia of genius. But anyway, anybody right. else? Yeah, I guess I was curious, but did he ever discuss much about the, the Eastern Church? Because you, if you're talking about the establishment of Christianity yeah. in the, what was it, the 12th century, and I think Sajay said something about the Carolingian period at one point, but then you have, I mean, the Patriarchate of Constantinople was already established at that point for several hundred years. So was there something more pure about that kind of establishment, or did I, it just escape his analysis? I think he viewed modernity as a mutation within Latin Christendom. Uh, that's a phrase of Charles Taylor's, but I think it would apply to Ivan too. So I think he certainly excluded the Eastern Church and admired it. I don't think he ever said a great deal or wrote a great deal about it, but he certainly was always very specifically talking about the Western and Roman mm -hmm. Latin church. During the, the history of the gaze, though, mm. you very much used the Eastern it. church and the icons yes. as, this a, is true. as a way to contrast against what was happening in the Western and Latin. Yeah, and there's a couple of papers that were published here f from SDS on that. And a chapter called The Gospel and the Gaze in my book, The Rivers North of the Future, <coughs> where it's true. You see more of his admiration for the Eastern Church. Wolfgang. There is a, a funny and, and bustling story 
uh, when he talks about the pilgrim who goes from China to the Western world. Yes. And it gets worse <laughs> each step. So in China, uh, the pilgrims are just, uh, the houses are opened up for them, and a little bit the same in the Eastern Church in Russia. In Poland, the people are already put up in, or get some money, and then in the Western part, they get into a hotel or motel or whatever. <laughs> so it's yeah. Friendship and love and hospitality gets more and more uh, institutionalized from the East to the West. Yes. So the Eastern Church is better than the Western Church in this story. I don't know now where, where it is, but I... Yeah, it's in one of my books, uh, ah, yeah. and it's a story that Jean Danielou ah, yeah. told him. Yeah. Yeah. So... You don't have to ask a question. You can just say something if you are so moved. But getting back to the New Testament yeah. um, and the, the Good Samaritan, what I most remember from the story is that the Samaritan experiences a kind of spontaneous uh, convulsion of compassion for the people yeah. traveling. And it's neither something he's been schooled in. Nor is it a, a supernatural revelation. I wonder if Tevada ever spoke to that moment. Yeah, he, he would put great emphasis on the Greek word used, right? Wow. Which is the word that the King James Bible translates as bowels, right? So, so Paul says it's, it's, that they're. Moved in, he speaks of the bowels of Christ, but the the Samaritan is said to be moved also in his guts. In his, I can't I can't pronounce the Greek word, Greek word that's used in the New Testament. But yeah, so it was tremendously important to him that this was a physical, a bodily, let's say, a bodily wow. experience, and therefore and limited, was, right? And hmm? Therefore limited, also. Absolutely limited that's the by that of by limits. that also. Yeah, it worked. Right. Yes. Christ. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And yeah, and can only work so long as it's circumscribed. I would I guess would be the corollary. I sense of flagging. You, I sense a weakness. I sense. A I sense <laughs> I sense the need I sense for wine and a, a, a desire for dogfish head. Yes, we had uh, behind you sits a man who was saying that we had to deal with the encyclical and right. What? Laudatus. Yeah. He's asking about the encyclical. Yeah. How what did he react to the encyclical? Uh, Laudatus. Well, I was uh, I was beaten up last night for not having read it. <laughs> um, so I'm not the best man to talk to, but Dr. Palmer may have something to say about it. I think it, it's a lot of people recognize it as as in as certainly being somewhat in Ivan spirit, right? Certainly in this the spirit of Romano Guardini, who was one of Ivan's teachers and who was often cited in it, as I understand. So, yeah, I think Trent also felt that way. Uh, but I'm, I'm an ignoramus. Uh, one of the, I mean, I think he would share the insight that some of the technology got out of, out of our hands. So it was not intentionally created, but uh, it's going to, to has power over human beings without uh, being in charge again. So I think he would see this counter Counterproductivity counter is a very important village term, and you find it also in the in the. In the, <coughs> the second thing, I think the, there is a very strong mystical side in in a mystical side, and this mystical side in the encyclical is also in a broader sense of formulated, not just a Catholic uh, mystic, but uh, the both. Uh, quotes a Sufi thinker, so he really goes into a deeper mystical experience necessary to to recover a new sense of limits, a new sense uh, to the environment. 
And I think that that is that is very close to to even Illich because in Illich you also uh, see if you look carefully a very strong mystical side when he talks about silence uh, and those things. And the third thing is uh, a quote of the Pope uh, where he says, "Are these problems that we have to face?" Can an individual deal with it? And of course not. And so uh, he quotes uh, Romano Guardini and says, we need networks of people collaborating. And I mean, networks can be very big. Uh, and if too big is not uh, probably the best solution. But many networks of people who help, help each other to, to, to go in another direction, I think, goes very much into a village inside these circles of philia, of friendship <coughs> that he created all over the world. I, I didn't reflect until yesterday <laughs> the evening, but I think uh, if one would really now study image and encyclical, one would find even more profound uh, things that, uh, than those that I just roughly mentioned after I was shocked yesterday hearing that David has not read. <laughs> if actually, when I get back to Florence, the first thing I'm going to do. But he's not a Catholic. I mean, well, you uh, can one, excuse him for that. Yeah. But, <laughs> <laughs> no, but the interesting thing is also the ecumenical dimension. Uh, as I said, he quotes a Sufi uh, thinker, but also there are two or three paragraphs that goes to the Eastern Church where he quotes uh, Patriarch Bartholomeus, and when the encyclical was uh, uh, promoted, uh, Bartholomeus was also there. So it's really an yeah. ecumenical thing, and this ecumenical thing is again very strong uh, going in the direction of Illich, because what, what I'm always fasc fascinated, because when he wrote those things, ec ecumenism was not as necessary as it is today, and it's really, uh, very strong in the image. And, and the Pope also understood, I mean, at least the religions have to go together in this regard. And the place to look for this is in the powerless church. Many of the essays uh, in that book. Uh, it is the only place, for example, where mysticism is discussed is in an, an essay called Concerning... And as you well know, the, David... What's it called? Concerning theological? Concerning aesthetic and religious aesthetic experience. Aesthetic and religious experience. Time ripens, David. Yes, so it does. Perfectly. Why? Because your act of contrition tomorrow is to read what you haven't. <laughs> and, and Paul's act of contrition right now is to go and buy that book. Yes. <laughs> and we shall call the event to a close. Thank you all for coming. Tomorrow we, we convene again.